Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm your host, Deborah Morgan. You know, it's rare in the TV news business for a station to be able to tap into the expertise of a reporter who has cultivated sources and intrinsic knowledge of a community for nearly 30 years. Amanda Lamb is just that reporter. She's leaving WREL at the beginning of 2024 as one of the longest serving reporters in the station's history. She's also an accomplished author, blogger, and, as you know, a regular podcaster here on The Daily Download and several longer format podcasts. Amanda, what an amazing career you have had so far. What made you, take us back to the beginning, what made you want to be a reporter? You know, Deborah, I did not think about being a reporter when I was growing up. I thought about being a writer because I always loved to write. And I joke that I started writing at four years old. I took, you know, the lined notebook paper from, you know, Mm -hmm. a a notebook and wrote little stories and then made covers with construction paper (laughs) and stapled them together. But honestly, I remember seeing an ad, and you might remember this, the Haynes ad, when the reporter is like running up the courthouse steps. She's got her trench coat on. Absolutely. And her pad, and I think a microphone. Back then, we didn't have wireless microphones, so she was probably (laughs) attached to a photographer dragging him along, chasing after somebody to interview them. And I was like, wow, that looks interesting, because I had always done theater growing up. So it kind of married the two loves that I had, which was performing and writing. But honestly, I went to Duke and um, I did an internship at our competitor, WTVD, when I was a senior in college. And at that point, I said, yeah, there's something here. There's something really dynamic and engaging about broadcasting. And I thought, hey, I'll give it a try. And I did. Well, you've definitely been so successful over all of these years. You've covered stories around the 23 counties WREL covers all over the state, the country, the world. What assignment or story really stands out the most to you? You know, there's so many, obviously. And most people think of me as a crime reporter. But I will have to say probably – I'm going to give you two. Um, The first one was Hurricane Katrina. Mm. So I went there two weeks after. I went there six months after. I went there a year after. Um, Two weeks after, I went in an RV with a producer and a photographer and an engineer. And we lived in Walmart parking lots uh, with, you know, whatever provisions we needed we had to have with us. And I just remember, because I had seen hurricane damage here in North Carolina, but seeing the magnitude of that damage in Louisiana and Mississippi and feeling the kindness of the people who had lost everything, and yet they invited us to sit down with them and talk to them, um, it was really remarkable. And I had young children then. It was a big decision for me to leave for several weeks, which was the first trip that we went on. But I'll never regret it because I think it just really opened my eyes to tragedy and and what people experience in a, in a way that really informed all of my hurricane reporting after that. So the second one might also surprise you. Uh, in 2017, I had an opportunity to go to Uganda with um, my partner and photographer, Chad Flowers, to cover their global neurosurgery team. And they were doing basically pro bono brain surgery for people Um, throughout the continent of Africa, and hundreds of people lined up to get this surgery, um, which was just really overwhelming to see that. They only had, at the time, just a handful of brain surgeons in uh, in Africa that could do this surgery. So these these Duke doctors and other doctors that came with them were um, saviors. And my mother had died of a brain tumor in 2012. So this was Mm -hmm. Just it was so moving. We came back. We were supposed to do, you know, five, six stories. We did a documentary called yeah. Mission of Mercy. Um, and it, it was just really powerful. Absolutely. I remember that so well. It, it really goes to show, too, that really being immersed and on the ground and talking with the people right there where they are is gives you such a different perspective than just reading a story or, you know, nowadays we do a lot of Zoom interviews. So being there and being able to tell their stories is just a whole different way of storytelling. And that's the only way I know how to do it. I was raised in journalism at a time we didn't have the Internet. Believe it or not, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have (laughs) cell phones. We didn't have – we just went. We just went and we talked to people. And that's still the kind of journalism that I love to do. Yeah. I know. I'm with you there. All right. We're going to be right back with more with Amanda Lamb right after the break. 
And welcome back to the WRL Daily Download with WRL's Amanda Lamb, at least for a little while longer <laughs> before uh, she leaves WRL at the beginning of 2024. You talked about this a little earlier. You're most known for your crime reporting. You've written books on some of the high profile cases you've covered. What drew you do you think, to cover some of these crime stories uh, compared to other stories? You know, and I know people ask me this all the time, and I've talked about it in interviews, but I think I really discovered the genesis of that when I did the last podcast. I did the True Crime Podcast, The Killing Month, August 1978. I did that uh, with my dad. My dad was a prosecutor. I grew up watching him. I grew up watching this particular case that we documented, this 45-year-old case, Uh, for the podcast. And I think that that early experience, seeing what a criminal investigation looked like, meeting the people involved in the case, meeting the victims' families, being in the courtroom, which is part theater and part law, kind of putting those things together and understanding, uh, well, maybe not understanding it completely at that age, but seeing how that all worked was fascinating to me. And I always thought I'd be a lawyer. I actually thought I'd be a prosecutor. Just I like mean, your dad. Yeah, just like my dad. And my mother mother was a lawyer, too. So I kind of surprised myself when I went in this direction and just became so interested and enamored with covering something from the, investi- the crime, through the investigation, to the arrest, to the trial, and oftentimes through the retrial. <laughs> you know, so right. I, I got to see how the system works all the way through. And sometimes it works really well. And as we know, with innocence cases that we've seen in the last few years, sometimes it doesn't work well. Um, and I I really was very interested in covering both sides of that. I feel like that's a genre of stories that you can't really just jump into. You do have to kind of have a legal background, have sources with the police department that trust you to share informa- information with you so you really kind of get the whole story. Maybe you can't, like— cite people who tell you this, but they trust you enough to be able to share that with you. Absolutely. I mean, I've joked with our boss, uh, Rick Gall, many times that I'm the closest thing he has to a lawyer (laughs) on TV (laughs) Yeah, because I did learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've probably watched more trials than many lawyers have ever tried, especially murder trials. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It's all about relationships. I mean, that's everything is about that in life. And, um, you know, we're moving so quickly now in journalism that I think sometimes we forget that, yeah. that it is about those relationships you make and, and getting people to trust you and being authentic and being able to relate to everyone. We are so polarized today. And you have to be able to go to the small town um, or the big city or wherever. You need to be able to go to the governor's office and also to the general store in a small town and talk to people. And you have to be authentic because if you're not, people, people know. They'll see right through exactly. It. You've talked too about wanting to share crime stories because you want to humanize the victims to make sure that their stories are told. Absolutely. I mean, every time I've been invited into a family's home, uh, especially a family that's lost a child, you know, those are the some of the really so tough difficult. cases. And oftentimes they've left the child's room the way that the child, you know, I'm yeah. talking about maybe a teenager or even a, a young adult, and. Um, they take you into that room and show you pictures and, you know, awards and trophies and, and maybe home videos, and they talk about their loved one. It's so humbling that somebody has invited you into this really difficult time in their lives, mm-hmm. um, the hardest time that they've probably ever had in their life, a nightmare. No doubt. Um, but I also think that the defendant's families are often victims because they didn't commit these crimes mm. and they still love the person right. Right, that committed the crime or, uh, or is accused of committing the crime. And so there are just so many layers to these cases and, and really handling it from a compassionate, humanistic perspective as much as you can is so critical to being able to tell the story in a way that isn't just broad brushing it and yeah. and and definitely not exaggerating it but saying right. this is the human cost of what's happening here it's not black and white when it comes to there's just a suspect there's just a no, victim there's so much more yeah it, it's never just black and white yeah. and um you know again i've been really humbled by the people who have invited me into their lives and i have long term relationships he talked about the books that i wrote with some of these families that i i still exchange christmas cards with and an occasional email or text or social media communication because um you know we were 
we were in each other's lives for years right. while these cases went through the system. That's really special that you can forge those relationships, as you said, in such difficult times in people's lives. You know, I, I also think that this is a career that you just can't turn it off when you go home. You are the mother of two daughters. You're also a wife to Griff. How do you find that work-life balance? How have you been able to do that over the years? Yeah, I would say not well. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you about that. I've had regrets looking back at the way I raised my kids sometimes, and and I've asked them, you know, are you okay? Um, I think they were because I worked and I worked hard and I cared about what I did. I was happier because of that, and I think that that is good to show your kids. I think it also allowed them to be strong and confident and stand on their own two feet and have to figure out things for themselves. Um, I think it also was good for my husband because he has such a close relationship with my daughters. We were absolute partners in raising them together. Um, You know, I think exercise has been a big part of my life, and that's helped. Writing, of course. I do writing outside of TV. And then um, friendship. I have such a tribe of women, I can't even tell you. Multiple tribes, really. Um, But, you know, my core group um, just supported me, and I can bounce ideas off them. And so having time with them in addition to lots of exercise, big (laughs) runner, yoga. Right now I'm running and doing yoga. That's fantastic. But that kind of just, you know, grounds you. Yeah, no doubt about that. How do you think the TV news business has changed? We talked a little bit about about how fast it's going now. What is your advice to people who want to be reporters in this day and age? Yeah, I would I would say, you know, it's great that we have all these new platforms to meet people on, right? All of the social media platforms, you know, now we have podcasting and, and you know, but there's a lot of pressure on young journalists to be everywhere all the time yeah. to everyone. And I would caution them. I would say, remember what the basics are, right? The basics are we have to get it right. If we don't get it right, it doesn't matter if we were first on TikTok. It doesn't matter. We have to get it right. We have to be kind. We have to be human in every interaction that we have, whether it's with a police officer, a victim, a lawyer, uh, a witness. We have to to take all of those interactions and remember that we're representing something. And there's a lot of polarization, as I said, and there's a lot of negativity towards the media. And the way that we combat that is by being fair, being honest, being credible. And again, I just believe in the old adage of just go. You know what? You can call, you can email, you can text, you can social media me, you can message me. But if you just show up in my town, you know, at my business, at my door, um, I might talk to you and I might ignore all those other things. You know, and so I just think at the end of the day, it's about relationships. It's about being kind. It's about being authentic. And it's about just sticking to the tenets of journalism, which is, you know, we are here to tell people's stories. We are not here to have an opinion. Right. We are not here to exaggerate. Right. And I know we're moving fast, but sometimes we need to be the ones to say, let's pump the brakes. Right. Because this story's not ready to go, or we don't have everything, or I'm not sure about this. And and be brave. You know, stand up and say those things when you have those feelings. 100% agree with you. Yeah. What do you think you're going to miss the most? Oh, no doubt the people. I mean, I've, I have I said the other day, I've been here almost half my life, and, um, and Ed Wilson, our chief photographer, said, no, you've been here more than half your life. <laughs> He's like, can you do math? I said, no, I'm a writer. I can't do math. But it's true. I have grown up here. I mean, I came here as a green reporter. I had two jobs before this, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Portland, Maine. But I became a journalist at WREL, and that started in 1994. I had my children on TV. I Mm -hmm. mean, I was pregnant up until, you know, the last second, you know, doing a story the day before in both situations. Um, You know, all of the things that happened in my life happened on this stage, if you will, in front of our audience. And I can't tell you how kind people have been. Um, We always hear the negative, and there is the negative. There's no doubt. But um, Mallory, my oldest, she was sick as a baby. People knitted me, you know, baby hats and Mm. sent me poems and everything you can imagine. Um, And then, you know, I went through, again, having children, getting married, all the things. My mom got sick in 2012. 
And again, people sent me prayer shawls and and flowers and things that, you know, they didn't have to do. I mean, these were just strangers. These were people that let us into their living room every night. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss the kindness of the people when I go to a small town and they go, oh, my gosh, I've been watching you forever. <laughs> Not great. You know, people like and ask. And we feel like they're part of, we're part of their family. 100%. It's, just the, it's the biggest compliment. I mean, I've signed, I don't know, you probably have two cocktail napkins oh, absolutely. in <laughs> diners and taking so pictures nice. with people. Um, but really, the people here. So the people in the newsroom, I used to say to people, I've stayed at the party too long. And part of the reason is it's like high school. It's like when I walk down that row, you know, to your locker, but to my desk every day, I'm seeing all of these people that I don't just like. Like, I love them. Yeah. I have I, I know them. I know their families. I know their children. And of course, you know, it's a new day. People have left and retired, and we've got not young, new, energetic people coming in, which is awesome. Um, and so, you know, I'm passing the baton. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do next? Oh, my gosh. So I think I'm going to be busier than I've ever been, honestly. Um, a so co- retirement is not what you're doing. No, no. no more chapters, no Deborah. Word. At least 20. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have another book that I've written, another mystery. Um, it's a brand new set of characters. So I'm working on getting that published. Um, I am working on some podcasts, not news. I'm doing my own thing. So I'm working on a lifestyles podcast about women over 50 called Ageless, which is going to be about women transforming themselves later in life. So a little bit close to home. <laughs> Very. But I know so many women that are in that boat. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work, so I plan to continue that. Maybe do some podcasting with some nonprofits, which I would love. That's great. Um, yeah, so just a million things. I write, I speak, I do some true crime shows. Um, hopefully, see my daughters more because yeah. they're in the Northeast. But yeah, I'm I'm available to help people <laughs> with anything that involves communication. So yeah, I'm I'm excited to have a voice. You know, as journalists, we have to be. We have to be careful. We have to be very straightforward. We have to always be objective and unbiased. And I remember a friend of mine who was a judge, and when he finally retired, he said, you know, you don't have a voice until you are out of this type of mm. field. So, you know, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Uh, stand, stay tuned. <laughs> well, you seem so excited. Yeah, I'm excited for just a new chapter. Absolutely. Yeah. And definitely bittersweet. Um, love my family here at WRL. It's going to be really different. But yeah. I'm just down the road. I'm not. You guys <laughs> not are going, going to get far. rid of me. Oh, and I'm teaching at Meredith College. And oh, I'm, great. A lot of you are coming and speaking. Good. Yes. And then that's hope, fun. Hope bring my students here for a tour. So it'll be great. weird to come here as a guest. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I hope to stay very closely linked to everyone here. Well, that's great because a, a lot of what I think about, too, is that we've spent 30 years here at WREL and you don't want that to just evaporate no, the day you walk out the door. No. You want that to be passed along. Absolutely. So you're going to be doing that. And it's your legacy. You know, it's your legacy for the rest of your life, wherever you go, wherever I go, you're going to be introduced as, yeah. you know, the anchor at WREL, the reporter at WREL. And we're proud of that. Yeah. Right. It's no something doubt. that we're really proud of. And, you yes. know, it's it's our legacy. And, and if we can help other young journalists along the way, um, that's why I'm teaching journalism, because I want to help. I Absolutely. Love Amanda, it has been such an honor and privilege for me to be working with you all of your 29 years and all of the experiences that we had together, both in the studio, out in the field. And I just think you're an amazing person, an amazing reporter, and I will miss you. But I'm just so glad you're, you're right down cry. the street. <laughs> uh, I'll, right back at you, friend. Right yeah. back at you. Thank you. Well, Amanda, we, we wish you the best in 2024 and beyond. Thanks for listening to the WRL Daily Download. If you'd like to hear more about things to do, places to visit, and restaurants to enjoy in North Carolina, check out WRL Out and About, a weekly podcast from WRL News. Find WRL Out and About in your podcast app.